Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome back to another episode of The Health Detective. I am really super excited tonight. I'm going to introduce you to my sister from another mother. But <laughs> Thank you. An amazing lady to have here. And she is an expert in food addiction or carbohydrate sugar addiction. So, Bitten, thanks for coming. It's absolutely delightful to have you here. It's a real honor. Well, getting to know you is a joy. So. <laughs> yeah, I love it. We are uh, sisters in what we work with, and we are dog sisters. And we are dogs and outdoor, dog sisters, and outdoor sisters as well. And so outdoor sisters. Yes, yes, yes. I love it. So, love it. Much, so much. Yeah. yeah. But and would you start off just <laughs> everyone a little bit about your background? I know you've been in, um, you started studying addiction about 37 years ago, and you've been doing this particular field for probably 30 years now. Um, One and nine. 29 in the world food, yes. with food yes 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 <laughs> yeah. so would you just tell us a little bit about you know yourself what you got you here <clears throat> yeah where you live you're in Sweden and uh, again amazing internet connections we're so privileged yeah 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 uh, yeah it's wonderful today we travel fast today just push a button <clears throat> Well, you know, uh, my life story in short, because of course that's quite long, but it started with me loving sugar when I was a kid and I was the oldest of seven. So we were, you know, a, a family living in the country and my mom cooked everything from scratch from, you know, uh, there were no processed food, nothing with labels on. So, you know, that's the way I grew up, but I still loved sugar. So I stole sugar lumps, you know, the little cubes we had in the coffee. I always went around sneaking those. And my parents were always slapping my fingers. Uh-uh, I, I, only one. So I thought Sugar's name was only one. So I said, <laughs> can I have only one? And then I said, can I have only one again? Uh, you know, uh, so, but that was, and they weren't, you know, uh, sodas or, I think I drank soda when I was 13. And thank God I never loved it. Mm. I never liked soda. Uh, so that was, you know, I have had maybe three cokes in my life before I quit oh, eating sugar. Yeah, yeah, that's it. No, uh, but you know, I loved ice cream and chocolate. So whenever I got around to get that, I would not stop. I was, you know, I wanted to have more and more and more. <clears throat> and of course, nobody understood this at that time. But when I was a teenager, you know, I started on the dieting because not that I was, if I look at pictures, I wasn't overweight, maybe chubby, but you know, everybody dieted. So it was like something you should do. And that means, of course, off and on, off and on, you know, starving, binging, starving, binging, which is the best way in the world to totally destroy your metabolism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so, of course, I did. And then, but you know, I didn't have a lot of consequences during my teenage year. And um, I, I, Say that that's because I never got around to get so much of it, of the things I liked. Uh, when I was, uh, but anyway, in nursing school, that's where you learn all the crazy things. I learned that if I started smoking, my appetite would be lower. So I could abstain more from these uh, sweets that I love, the ice cream and the chocolate and all, uh, all that. So I started smoking and I loved smoking. I was a nicotine addict from day one, lighting up a cigarette. And also it was, you know, stylish and all that. So that's what we thought. But anyway, and then uh, when I was 19 and a half about, we were go out dancing, so we were drinking. So I started drinking and I loved drinking. So, you know, and there is no trauma or misery in my life that it caused my addiction. I want to really point that out. And that's the way it is for most people. Addiction is a, a primary acquired illness. It has to do with the drug hitting the brain. And of course, if you have a lot of negative things happening in your life, it only gets worse, but it didn't cause it. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand that. Because a lot of people feel, oh, there's something flawed with me, something bad, and you know, all that. And because, and it's because this happened to me and that happened to me. Well, those uh, traumas and negative things happening can aggravate your addiction, but it did not cause it. Extremely important to understand because a lot of people run around in therapy today looking for 
what caused my addiction. And that's the wild goose chase. Because no matter if you find out things that were bad for you, uh, since it is not the cause, dealing with it is not going to heal you from addiction. So very important. So anyway, uh, nursing school, drinking, I love drinking uh, until my uh, now ex-husband, American, said to me that uh, you're an alcoholic. And I almost hit him. I was so mad. How could you call me an alcoholic? You know, uh, it was horrible. But anyway, I ended up in a treatment center 26th of September, 1985. So I've been sober since from, uh, mm -hmm. actually I was drunk when they admitted me. So from the 27th of September, <laughs> 1985, I, I am not even looked at alcohol. And why is that? Yeah, because they gave me such an incredible treatment. You know, they taught me about the brain, the reward center, about dopamine at that time. This was a new way, Capistrano by the Sea, Newport Beach, California, is supposed to be the best treatment center at that time. They have a very holistic team. We learn about food. We learn about so many things. I'm forever grateful. That was the best training I've had as a nurse because, you know, I've been a nurse since 1973. Nobody talked about these things in nursing school. Nothing. Uh, I knew nothing about nutrition, by the way. So anyway, uh, here I was not drinking, but I kept smoking, drinking lots of coffee. And I'm a very high strung personality, you know. Uh, I love everything going fast and, you know, uh, all that kind of thing. So I loved it. And I went to support meetings and I kept staying sober. And then when I've been sober for seven years, I met Terence Gorski. He had a profound effect on me. Uh, and the way he, the things he was teaching was just blew my mind. Um, uh, he was in Sweden lecturing. This was in February, 1992. And he said that alcoholics, pill and drug addicts that keep, you know, drinking lots of coffee, eating junk food and smoking, they have a higher incidence of relapse. And I go, what? I don't want to relapse. You know, I've been sober for seven years. I'm not going to relapse. How is that connected? So that made me start thinking about, well, it has to do with the brain and biochemistry. As a nurse, you know, it wasn't far off thinking that. So I remember getting on him right away and said, I have to come and do training with you. So I went to Chicago several times and he became my mentor. And if you want to look him up, uh, his page is cnaps, C-E-N-A-P-S dot com. And uh, he died two years ago, and his predecessor, or whatever you call it, Roland Williams, is one of the teachers in my training today, oh, which I'm so yeah. grateful for. I'll make sure uh, I so, a show notes version. Yeah, yeah, do that. Well, uh, anyway, uh, so, and, you know, I thought, oh, my God. So I, uh, the first thing I thought about after the lecture, I have to quit smoking and cut down on coffee. And then I thought, but thank God I don't like junk food. Because the only connection I did with the word junk food was McDonald's. I didn't think ice cream and, <laughs> and chocolate was junk food. It was normal food, you know. Oh, God. But this, that's how much I knew as a nurse about nutrition. Yeah. It's scary thinking about it. But anyway, so I started to <clears throat> learn more about that. And I started to see the connection. And then I read a book called The Hidden Addiction by Janice Keller Phelps. And that book totally blew my mind because what she said was that under alcoholism, pill addiction, drug addiction is sugar addiction. So already this, she wrote it, I think, 1986 or 1989. Yep. Uh, yeah. And she still isn't really recognized. She died without being very recognized. And I wrote my last book, 2016, as a what do you call it, as a tribute to her? Uh, because I think what she wrote in that book is just blowing my mind. She knew, she knew, but there was no research, nothing at that time, but she saw this. And I saw this working with alcoholics, drug addicts and pill addicts, which is what I started with. And then in 1993, when I had quit smoking, <laughs> cutting down on coffee, uh, uh, quit McDonald's, which I I've never been to McDonald's. I'm not a McDonald's person. I'm not a, into flour, you know, buns and bread and pizza. That's never been my quick fix. 
it's always ice cream and chocolate. But anyway, uh, and God, did I get sick when I quit smoking. And I had no idea it was so uh, powerful. So every evening I was eating chocolate and ice cream, chocolate and ice cream, and, and saying to myself, like, you know, we addicts love denial because we do, don't have to face reality. So I said, well, it's only for tonight. I'm going to quit tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. or Monday or after vacation or next year or New Year's and blah, blah, blah. You know, because the power of the drug over our reward center is so strong. So we do almost anything to keep the drug without understanding we're killing ourselves. Mm. So that's one of the things that I have point out to my clients. You know, they say, oh, I did this and that and blah, blah. And this happened. I said, that's because you want a drug. No, they said, yes, it is. I said, you back in your mind, you want the back door to the drug. You can't fool me. No way. So uh, you have to be frank. Uh, so anyway, uh, I started to understand the power of sugar. And Gorski <clears throat> told me a lot too. So in 1993, in October, I went back to U.S., to the drawing board uh, because they are best in the world in addiction. I worked with this the longest time. And somebody said to me, but how can you, how can you think US knows most about addiction? Look at their big problem. And I said, yeah, that's why they are the best because they have the biggest problem in the world and the worst junk food ever. So they have to develop some kind of methods uh, and they know addiction. So don't, you know, that's it. No other country in the world understands addiction the way they do. So anyway, uh, I went back to a Lutheran General Hospital in Chicago, where I knew they had a program by a recovering alcoholic woman. She worked with people with food addiction, as they call it at that time, you know, the same way she worked with alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And of course it works because it's the same addiction. Mm -hmm. So today we have a lot of <clears throat> knowledge about what we call addiction interaction disorder. You know, almost every client has more than one outlet, you know, so usually sugar addicts, they like alcohol, but they eat most of the time. So they don't think they're alcoholics. But if you run them through the screening and diagnostic tool that I work with, you see that they have problems with alcohol too, mm -hmm. and nicotine and pills and gambling. And I mean, there is, they have several outlets. So one of my uh, counselors, Mel Martin in Cornwall, she said <clears throat> when we were in, in Bristol working this spring, yeah, addiction is the shape shifting beast. And I thought, oh, she nailed it. That's exactly what it is. Hmm. Uh, and what I learned in US was that addiction is the big imitator. It looks like a lot of other problems, but under is the addiction. Right. Yeah. So if you're going to work with addiction, you have to have the skills to peel the layers off and see the addiction. Because if you don't work with an addict, if they are an addict, they're not going to ever get into recovery and healing. That's, uh, yeah, that's very important. So can I ask you to explain the difference between harmful use and addiction. And, yeah, absolutely. And then why it's really important for someone who thinks that, you know, who may be thinking that they're an addict, that they are managed and treated differently because, you know, you've, you've, you've explained to me the reasons that we can't treat an addict the same way that we treat a harmful use person. No, we can't because a harmful user is uh, overeating, uh, dieting, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> having all kinds of weird things going on over from a reason like stress, uh, you know, emotions or the culture they grew up in or not having knowledge what proper food is. There's many reasons why they do it, but they do not have the brain illness, the rebuild of the reward center in their brain, which makes them lose control in a very special way that addicts does. An addict can quit, but they always start again, unless you treat them, you know. Uh, so they say, yeah, but I can quit if I want to. Sure, for how long? Usually they can quit for up to three months and then they're right back in the, in the illness again. Whereas with a harmful user, <clears throat> uh, 
you uh, look at their consequences, you know, the negative harmful use they have, and you can deal with that. And they, you work with them with moderation therapy, i.e. you teach them about proper food. You make sure you understand when is it you overeat? Is it when you're stressed or sad or mad or did it, did, you know? Or, you know, you're taught to eat in a certain way in a culture, which is very harmful to the body because they don't understand metabolism. So they can have moderation therapy. You can adjust and improve their eating habits and their lifestyle and teach them about proper stress coping mechanisms and sleep and blah, 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 blah. An addict <clears throat> is totally out of control. Uh, you know, they lose control from one bite. We have a saying that one bite is too much, thousand is not enough because they have a biochemical problem in their brain. It's like an allergy, you know, once they start eating the, the drug foods, as I call it, you know, all hell break loose in their brain and they get into craving like you wouldn't believe. And they're going to start hiding, lying, sneaking, and they are compelled to get the drug. They're like an airplane without a pilot. It's just going to go. <clears throat> and and so, just, just to clarify that with you, because this was something I asked you earlier, was they only have to have one bite, don't they? It's not like they can take it, you know, not eat that food for three months or four months. No, 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 no. And then, yeah. and then once they have that. You have, to take, you have to take away all sugars, all sweeteners, yeah. all flour products, you know, and all processed food, anything that has a label. And most of them cannot have uh, certain milk products like whipped cream, cheese, yogurt, Creme, creme fraiche, you know, I can't have that because it triggers. It's the casein, the milk protein will trigger the craving mm. because it, it acts as an opiate on the reward center. <clears throat> they can usually have butter or ghee. Some can't even have that. So, and then nuts is a big, big trigger. They can't have nuts in any way, shape or form. So you have to develop a, a so-called drug-free food plan for them. Otherwise, you're going to constantly have like a craving <clears throat> and they're going to relapse all the time. So the difference between harmful use is moderation therapy with, uh, you know, addiction, uh, total 100% abstinence from all trigger foods and drug foods. Otherwise, their brain will never heal. So this is very important. So the, that's why I developed the diagnostic tool, you know, uh, diagnostic assessment tool built on the international diagnose criteria, uh, WHO's ICD-10 and American Psychiatric Association's DSM-5. That's a questionnaire, that's a structured interview where you ask the client 67 questions and then you know for sure, harmful use or addiction. And that's when you can make a proper uh, treatment plan uh, you have to dare diagnose because if you don't know the difference and if you don't know this person in front of me, is it harmful use or is it addiction? Mm -hmm. You might give the wrong treatment. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you were to give a harmful user, you know, addiction treatment, it wouldn't kill them, <laughs> but it would be harsher. But if you would give an addict a harmful use treatment, you would give them false hope and you're going to send them spiraling deeper into the illness. Mm. So that's why you need to understand that. So where does addiction start? Is this a connection between genetics and environment? You know, is there a genetic kind of programming for addiction or is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I say that we addicts are born with a very sensitive brain. And, you know, uh, the word sensitive triggers in some people uh, defect or bad. To me, that sensitive brain is an incredible superpower. It is highly wired, highly connected. So, uh, you know, it's like uh, the difference between if you get a, a tractor or a Ferrari. Um, you know, you're born with either one. A tractor, you can't, you know, take it to the race tracks. You're going to putter around, right? But if you have a Ferrari and you think you have a tractor and you try to, you know, run it that you're going to kill yourself because it has, you need higher skills, more understanding. So sensitivity is not defect. I used to compare with the Webb Space Telescope, 
very sensitive instrument. Yeah. Is it bad? No way. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you have to, as like I said, you have to have a new driver license if you have an addict racing brain and know how to handle it. That's it. So there is always a genetic sensitivity, but you, you don't inherit alcoholism or sugar addiction or whatever. You don't uh, inherit the illness. You inherit the sensitivity for it. But remember, about 70% of your genes are, you know, you can um, live a lifestyle, not only food, but that's very important, where, you know, your body turns on the good healthy genes or it turns on the garbage genes that's going to make you sick. So then you have to look at genetics, how sensitive am I? Some have higher genetic uh, level, others have lower. But on the other hand, uh, you know, what environment and, and food and lifestyle are you exposed to? So it's always a combination between, you know, the genetic, the uh, environment and the culture you grew up in. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you have to see that. And some people have, you know, 70% genetic and very little exposure and all that. And others have 30% genetic, but much higher exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination. And it's not interesting to find out what is what in that. Because that's like, you know, if you're a fire worker, you don't, uh, you don't need to know why it started to burn before you, uh, you know, before get you the fire out. Out. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, but after yeah. you have taken the fire out, it might be good to look at the predisposition mm. so you have a better chance at creating a healthier life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sort of. Mm. So you've got this um, tool that you use so people can yeah. come in, um, and you've got a whole lot of trained practitioners, haven't you? That yes, you, that's yes. they're on my website. Yeah. yeah, there is a page on my website, Sugar Professionals. You can find a professional there. And or so if you are a professional, you're welcome to train with me. I'm looking forward to doing that next year. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so can you just spend a few minutes and explain just a little bit about, you know, the neurotransmitters and, the, and dopamine and and what sugar does, does sure. to that, yeah. Well, first I would like to say that <clears throat> dopamine is the uh, fancy word today. Everybody knows about dopamine and dopamine release and dopamine fast and all kinds of things, how to increase dopamine. Uh, I like to point out that I was taught in the old school, which is still actual today. It is several neurotransmitters involved, glutamate, GABA. I mean, there is a whole array it's not only one pathway, mm -hmm. uh, serotonin and so on. So whenever, you know, a, a drug or a addict prone brain encounters a psychoactive drug or processes, psychoactive drugs are, you know, sugar, flour, sweeteners, processed food, nicotine, opioids, uh, tranquilizers, painkillers, uh, and street drugs, both the natural street drugs and the synthetic. There's a lot of drugs out there today. So anyway, when it encounters that for an addict, you get a big, huge release of dopamine, which is wonderful. Have you ever been in love? You know, I used to ask people that, have you been in love? And I said, did you take a pill? No. <laughs> well, you could say that falling in love is sort of a process addiction. It is something causing it, but you didn't take something in. So we differ between intake addiction, you know, the drugs I mentioned, and process addiction, like screens, gambling, sex and relationships, and so forth. And you asked me, could we be addicted to anything? Well, anything that feels pleasurable, we could probably be addicted to. Well, like we're all getting addicted to these things. Now. Yeah, screens, screens, uh, media. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we call those then process addictions. <clears throat> and the same, if, you, if we go back to the uh, main addiction, which is the sugar addiction, which starts everything, and then uh, you are more sensitive to start using other drugs if you're a sugar addict. We know that sugar is the gateway drug, starting to build, rebuild the pathway, causing a drug-sensitive, drug-seeking brain. 
the, the problem with when you keep doing that is that every time you get a big release of dopamine <clears throat> and you, you know, it's like a ripple effect on all the other neurotransmitters, the hangover, you know, gets worse and worse. Mm. And the problem is that uh, the brain develops something called tolerance. So if one piece of chocolate was good here, now you need two mm. and you can then, or three or five. So now you can start understanding the physical and mental and social and spiritual effect the drug has on you, because now you have a deep love relationship with the drug, mm. which excludes anything else. You lose intimacy, you lose your close <clears throat> connections with others, because with addiction comes hiding, lying, sneaking you know, doing this uh, by yourself and the drug feels all you need. So you don't need other things. You don't need your spouses or family or loved ones or dogs or whatever. They become second. Mm. The drug is all because it, the drug is ruling you. You think you control the drug, but ha, 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 the drug controls you now. And <clears throat> so you feel worse and worse because, you know, there's less and less dopamine and other neurotransmitters and the processed food today destroys your microbiome, your intestinal flora. And your intestinal flora is extremely important in making neurotransmitters. 90% of the, the, the uh, pleasure, uh, happy molecule serotonin is made in your intestine. Besides, you don't eat fo food that is the raw material for making neurotransmitters, which is essential proteins from animal kingdom, like meat, fish, eggs, you know, that type of thing. Those are the things, the proteins that we need in order to make more neurotransmitters. And not only that, eating all the junk food and obsessing and overeating or restricting and blah, 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 uh, you know, they gives us... Uh, um, you know, uh, we get low acid, low hydrochloric acid in your upper stomach. So you don't break down the food. So whenever you eat, it goes straight through you. You have no villi because gluten is an abrasive. So it ruins your villi in your intestine, the fine fluffy stuff that is so necessary to take up the nutrients from the food you eat. So now it goes straight through, you, you know, out in the toilet. Yeah. So now you're not making neurotransmitters. No wonder we feel anxiety, depression. We feel no energy. I think that is the biggest problem, that the energy level is fluctuating like crazy with the blood sugar. Mm. So one day you feel great, and the next day you feel you go, want to go and hide on the deserted island for the rest of your life. So this is what happened in the brain. And not only that, you know, uh, when the tolerance, the effect of the drug goes down and the tolerance increases, and I told you all the negative consequences of eating more, the craving increases. So now if you try to eat proper food, your brain is going to scream for the drug. I want chocolate. I want bread. I want... And uh, you're going to start, you know, uh, you're going to lose the power, uh, lose the battle all the time because willpower is nothing for the addicted brain. It just laughs at that. And I call the addicted brain the red dog and the healthy you the blue dog. So it's constant war. Today I'm not going to eat. Oh, shit, I need to eat today. I start tomorrow. Do, 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 do. And somewhere, you know, also the problem is that I say you get fast on your synapses from the drug mm -hmm. you get you get a brain that is hampered that is unable to make new neurons and connections you get a very unhealthy brain very negative brain so of course you know it's not and no energy i think that's what those combinations you know make you stuck in the rut and, and you think all the time yeah 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 i think yeah, but i'm going to start tomorrow but you wake up and you have pain all over your body you're tired like crazy and also people think they have to do this themselves. And I said, you can't, if you have addiction, it's a very, very serious, deadly brain illness. You need help from professionals. You're lost in the jungle, you know, and you can't find your way out. We who have been helped 
I got help to deal with my addiction. So that's why I can help others too. And also the professional training I have. So we come in the jungle and lead you out. Mm. You can't find your way out because you are confused. You're terrified. You have this craving. You have, you're miserable. You have no energy. And then people think they're going to pull them up with the bootstraps. How in the whole world is that going to work? Lift yourself in the hair. It's not going to work. So, and I think this is the bad part that people wait so long to seek help. So when people come to our specialists, they're really sick. God, they have consequences. do Do you think that's because it's so misunderstood and people just think they're weak. They've got a weak character. They don't have enough willpower. What's wrong with yeah. me? Why can't, <clears throat> yep. you know, why can't I do what I well, myself? Well, Red Dog do? wants you to think in that way. So Red Dog's only purpose is to keep the drug. It doesn't care if you die. Red Dog screams it wants to. It's going to fool you in hundreds of ways. <clears throat> so you keep eating the drug because all it is like a reptilian monster. Feed me, feed me, you know. And you lose the battle all the time. And then you run around thinking, oh, this is because of this. Uh, this happened because of this. So you run around in the wrong circles looking for why. You can't ask why with addiction. You have to start with how do I get out of this? Well, yeah. first step, knowing if you're addicted or not. Mm-hmm. And if you are, ask the professionals. And how many, what percentage of the population has addiction problems do you know is oh there... god well <laughs> i think it is so many that because of the food industry have made more and more dangerous foods today very dangerous foods especially in the u.s and that's spreading to the world uh, their aim is to sell food to you and make you keep eating it it's not your health i promise you they don't care one bit about that so we are absolutely brainwashed with you know, uh, all the goodies and the junk food. And, uh, and it's interesting when I tell people, you know, what they need to eat in order to heal, well, what they need to take away uh, to heal, they said, well, what's left to eat? They have forgot all the food we can eat, mm. you know, all the good proteins, all the good fats, all the good uh, veggies and all that. So that is more amazing, I think. What, what's left to eat? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I was just going to say, for someone listening to this who's thinking, gee, I wonder if I'm falling into this category, yeah. what, you know, what triggers, what would there be that you would say to them to help them know whether they should go and get properly tested? And Well, on my website, there is a simple screening form, six simple questions. They are built on the criteria for addiction. Uh, you know, answer those questions. If you have two or more yes there, you have a problem, but it doesn't say if it's harmful use or addiction, but I can tell you this. If you answer yes, honestly, to four or more, you're probably very addicted. Right. So that's a good screening instrument. So screening doesn't tell the whole truth, but I would say that I mean, I heard a number that 88% of American population has a metabolic syndrome, the insulin resist- resistance yeah. today. Yeah. I would think that 75% of them are addicted. So before, you know, I, I did two screenings at a nurse fair once. Mm-hmm. So total of 400 people. One third was what we call social users. They don't have any consequences and yeah. they eat very minimal. They take one little bite of chocolate and they said, oh, that was rich. That's enough. (laughs) And then uh, one third was harmful users. Oh, it's such a rainy, shitty day. I eat three pieces of chocolate. Yeah. And then the addicts, one third of that 400 people, they say, give me the box and where is the next gas station where I can buy more? That's the difference, you know, roughly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Today, if I were to do that again, on a big population, I think the addict part would be bigger than the other two. Right. Addiction is rampant in our society today and it starts very, very early. And I think Four, I, five I, actually, years in each. I actually counted up the number of conditions you had on your website that <laughs> are direct that are related to sugar addictions. And there were 75 conditions that you have on your website. So. And today we know more. 
Uh, I'm going to update that because, you know, today we have all the knowledge about the metabolic dysfunction that we didn't have. So uh, we are going to redo that one. But I'm telling you, uh, processed food, as you also can call this, you know, uh, with a common name, if you want, or sugars, as I say, uh, is, uh, you know, gives, it's toxic, it's poison to your body. Our bodies are not made to eat that because we have one sugar tank and that is tiny in our body. We have one fat tank, which is big. Yeah. So our bodies are made to make fuel and run on the fat tank to have stable energy, stable, you know, output. The sugar tank is only made for sort of emergencies, you know, or when we were moving the pack when we were nomads. So, you know, if you feed the sugar tank all the time, uh, you know, uh, you, you're not having any fat metabolism. You don't break down fat. Mm. You get so malnourished. And then suddenly you realize that I'm going to die if I don't get sugar because, you know, everything is on red in the gauge in your Ferrari. Mm. <laughs> so it's on red. And of course, then you are forced to keep eating sugars to stay afloat and go through the day. So that is was why you need somebody to guide you through the adaption process, switching fuel mix mm. into your body to get the fat tank working properly to put out fuel energy and, you know, lowering the, ga the sugar tank that screams for more sugar all the time. So that's one of the things we do with biochemical repair. Then there's other things like we work on sleep. Breathing is very important. You know, taping your mouth at night, using the relaxator, learning how to slow down your breathing, mm -hmm. doing nose breathing. It, you know, you don't burn fat if you don't have enough oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if you stress breathe up here, <laughs> the body can't catch the oxygen molecules mm -hmm. and the carbon dioxide, which is so extremely important for relaxing your vessels so that the oxygen can be transported to your cells and burn fat. So it's a lot to know about that. So, you know, and then we work on physical activity and I had so many clients look at me and said, oh God, you, are you gonna tell me I have to exercise? And I said, no, I forbid you. And they look, what? Yeah, you know what? You have the total wrong fuel mix in your body. Your cells, your mitochondria, which is the energy factory in your cells, they can't take up fuel. It would be criminal of me to force you to exercise. So what I'm going to do is repair your brain, you know, your neurotransmitters. Uh, I'm going to help you switch fuel tank by switching fuel mix. And then I'm going to ask you to take a short walk around the house. And that's maybe in three to six weeks. So we're not, you're not allowed to do exercise because you don't have an energy for it. And they almost start crying from relief because they have forced themselves to exercise on the wrong fuel. Mm. Can you imagine? That's, you know, almost killing you. Yeah. So I used to joke and say, put your jogging shoes on, step outside the door, take three breaths, go back in and rest. <laughs> and they, what? Yeah, that was session one. <laughs> so you and then it's amazing, you know, after about three to six weeks, depending on how sick you were, they come and said, hey, you know, uh, I like to walk with poles today or, you know, I like to do a power walk and yeah, fine, go ahead. Because then the energy is coming back in their life. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not forcing them to exercise at all. Actually tell them not to while they switch fuel mix. And the other thing that um, you've told me that I think is really important to understand you know, you were talking about the moderation for the for the social user or the harmful user, mm. but you can't mm. use that with the addict. And nope. one of the problems, I think, is that looking forward to the future and thinking, God, I've got to do this for the rest of my life. How am I going to do this? And you yeah. talked to me about you just do one meal at a time, one thing. Yeah. When, when I went into, you know, uh, the recovery program after my treatment and, you know, the, the ones that were ahead of me that seemed to be very content and happy, they looked at me and said, oh, this is so easy. All you, you have to do, you have to change everything in your life. 
And I go, what? You know, I about freaked out and thought, I can never do this. And that's a very common uh, thought and feeling that we all share. And, you know, I can't think about a life without chocolate and ice cream, uh, no more for the rest of my life. So I was taught, you know, to do it one day at a time, only for 24 hours. And if you have a really, really screwed up brain, it's hard to stay focused for one day. So break it down to one meal. But every morning, the first thing I think about still after all these years, I think, because it's like a mantra. So I wake up and I think, okay, no matter what happens today, I'm going to stick to my food plan, which is a keto food plan that works best for me. And it's my fuel mix, which I figured out, uh, you know, which I help people do. Well, I don't work with clients anymore, but my uh, counselors do. I teach them how. So <clears throat> I'm going to stick to my food plan, no matter what happens, no matter what. Okay. Number one. Number two, I say to myself, and this takes a few seconds. Uh, okay. What do I need to do today to stay in recovery? Not what do I have to or mm -hmm. must. What uh, do I need to do today to stay in recovery? That is allowing. Okay. So this is the way an addict lives because it's a chronic illness. So it's chronic life, lifelong maintenance. So I focus on today. I don't care. Tomorrow is not here yet, mm. you know, and I don't ruminate about all the days that have passed, the yesterdays, anything I did wrong or bad or whatever. There's no meaning thinking about that today. All I can think about today, what do I need to do to stay in recovery and take care of myself? You know, that's it. So those two things in the morning, and then uh, I also do a gratitude list. I mm -hmm. also wake up thinking, telling, it could be little things like, like my favorite rose is blooming, or it could be big things, you know, uh, anything. Uh, mostly it is, I'm grateful for, you know, my loved ones and the dogs and, uh, you know, humans and dogs. <laughs> I include dogs very much. And, and then at night when I go to bed, I can very briefly think, oh, okay, did I do something today that I can improve tomorrow? You should never, ever change your personality, but you can improve your behaviors. It's very, very important to understand personality and behaviors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people think they have to change their behavior, their personality. Uh-uh, never. You're going to get sick if you do that. So you are grateful for your personality, the way you are. And then you can improve your lifestyle, you know, the some things. So what did I learn today? Oh, well, it wasn't smart to go to town. And then, you know, my car broke down. I didn't have food with me. I had to chase around to get right food. So next time I have to do that, bring food. Oh, easy. Mm -hmm. Just a little example. So that's what I say to myself in the evening. And then I do gratitude again for the day. Those two things, you know, morning, evening takes just a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. but it's setting my day and it's only for today, only for today or only for breakfast and only for lunch and only for dinner. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think about all the fun things I'm going to do in between. Mm -hmm. I don't obsess about food. Mm -hmm. Never. Uh, I think about, oh, we're going to, oh, good weather. Me and Rosie, my dog, we're going to take a long walk today or you know, today I'm going to mow the lawn or I work. And I mean, there's always something. How, how important is planning for you? Because I think that's where people get into trouble a lot is they, they haven't. Well, planned. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I think one of the things addicts are perfectionists and they're black or white. So either they are a fanatic at planning yeah. and anything goes wrong. They say the hell with everything I'm going to eat. So yeah. planning could be dangerous. And also the prefrontal cortex, you know, in our brain is so hampered from the drug that the planning capacity is very lowered and the strategic thinking and solution focused thinking is very lowered. It needs to heal. But I think about preparation is a better word. You know, mm -hmm. I'm prepared. I'm thinking today, uh, you know, like when I shop food or uh, that I have food at home that I can cook from. I do food prep usually on Sundays. I cook a lot of food so I don't have to cook because I hate cooking. 
I mean, I think it's funny me having to have this illness and, you know, not like to cook, but I cook because I don't get the right food otherwise. So mm -hmm. I do big, you know, cooking so and I freeze. You, what about an unexpected circumstances? You know, what if you, you know, somebody will come and say, oh, I've been to a conference and they didn't have the right food to eat, you know? What well, I call ahead. I call ahead. If I go into a conference, I call ahead and see <clears throat> what are the places that serve food around. And mm -hmm. if I have to, I go to hamburger, Max hamburgers in Sweden are good. And I buy two hamburgers with nothing on it. Yeah. Nothing. And usually I have. So you're just the patty uh, you're talking about. Yes, just the patty. Yeah, just the patty. Or I can have some salad, you know. And then I always, if I go and travel and stay in hotel, I usually have coconut fat or MCT oil or olive oil. Olive oil you can always get at a restaurant in Sweden anyway. And uh, I have some butter or ghee with me so that I, because the problem is to get good fats when you're out traveling. Mm. So if I can, I take that. And, you know, if I'm in a situation where I can, I say to myself, okay, Nobody has died because they didn't have lunch. Nobody on the whole earth. So you can handle this until you get food in the afternoon. Because mm -hmm. it would be so typical thing. Oh, I can't have my lunch. Oh, I might as well eat chocolate. Ooh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but you know, that's the, way, that's the way it works in our brain. It's so sick. So that's what I do. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, oh. if I'm on a train, the train is stuck in a snowstorm, happened to me several times here in Sweden, you know, and usually I carry a couple of eggs, hard boiled eggs. Yeah, that's easy to snuck in my purse. So that's not a problem. So what about things like cheese and dairy? How, how, how do they? Well, most of us are very sensitive to the casein in uh, milk products like whipped cream, cheese, dairy. But we do much better. I do much better. So, and I know this is right for many of my clients with goat or sheep cheese. Right. Yeah. Like feta cheese. Uh, you know, I love that. Or uh, manchego, uh, pecorino, those cheeses. I do beautiful on them. No craving whatsoever. But as soon as I start eating a lot of other cheeses, I want more. Mm. And that's a true sign that it affects my brain. It's not my willpower or my character. It's the biochemistry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but you're saying that butter and ghee is a good option. So you're happy with that. Yeah, some people trigger yeah. on butter too. Most people don't trigger on ghee. Yeah. And yeah. What I eat a lot of ghee. Yeah. So you're talking about vegetables. What about starchy vegetables? you know we can't have those we trigger on that because it raises insulin and it affects our our uh, reward center so with vegetables you're talking about green above the ground vegetables and above the ground yeah we do best on those some people can tolerate a little bit of starchy uh you know like uh, carrots and a, a small amount but Something they notice is that, you know, they start eating that, they want more of that and less of the other thing. And anything you start wanting more of is alarm. And what about fruit? What about people wanting to oh, eat? No way. No, most people cannot tolerate that. And I, what about I eating berries? That. You know, berries are quite typical. Berries is fine, yeah. 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 We have, um, we pick uh, raspberries and blueberries here and I can eat those. I don't eat a lot of them, you know. Mm -hmm but I can eat it. So that works. Uh, so berries seems to work because they have very low carbs. I think raspberries is the lowest of all the fruit and berry family, carby. Uh, but you know, some people trigger on that too. So it's one thing to understand what the drug foods, the poison foods are, and then your personal trigger food. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you go about identifying those for people the trigger foods mm. i teach them what an, what the red dog how the red dog whispers in their brain yeah and i ask them to keep a food journal you know just uh, writing down uh, first of all what they eat and don't write down feelings and all that because you have so many false feelings in the beginning because of the drug that screwed up your brain so i have them to uh, talk about energy level, 10 high, high energy, zero one on the sofa, <laughs> almost dead. 
So the important thing is to restore energy in order to start dealing with doing the changes needed in your recovery. So I asked them to, you know, write uh, between uh, what's the energy level in the morning, between breakfast and lunch, between lunch and dinner, and in the evening, and start seeing the energy curve. Mm. And today you have all these wonderful gadgets, like you have the watches and the aura rings and all that. They can, uh, you know, measure that for you. Uh, but you have to relate it to what you eat uh, because food is our healer. It's the most important thing. You have to give your body nutrition in order for your body to heal. There's no other way around it. There's no pills, powders, magic tricks. You have to eat proper food. Uh, and I'm glad you raised that point because, you know, you've been talking about all those wonderful proteins and, you know, the amino acids that we get from those. And then there's yep. all those nutrients and, you know, for, for our bodies to make ATP and have energy. Yeah, right. depends right. on all those nutrients that come in. Yeah. Feed the mitochondria. I mean, you can't yeah. expect the factory to run at optimal if you give it junk. No, no. way. No. And we spend so much time focusing on the calories. How many how, how many that word? How many carbs? How much fat are we eating? And um, and we don't really concentrate on the nutrients. So I think yeah, no, I don't care about carbs and and you know all that kind of stuff. And uh, I advise my clients to not step on the scale because I don't work with a weight program. I work with healing a brain. Yeah, I work with the the bad uh, illness in the brain. But I tell you what, if you heal the brain the rewiring the nutrients the sleep the breathing the physical activity some supplements that when it's needed if you do that you know uh it's gonna then it's gonna start working and you have energy to do anything you want in life you're free mm. that's mm. what you are you're not free when you uh, when um, uh, this sugary foods rule over you and then you're able to you know, live your life to that potential that you, you know, that we all yeah, feel we have inside of ourselves yeah. and we're just yeah. so frustrated sometimes because we're not really, we're not really achieving what we think we should be yeah. achieving. Absolutely. And also, I like to say there are two, you know, Swedes love to walk with poles. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we laugh that, the Finnish do too, but we love that. We walk with poles year round. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I say that the crutches, the support system, the poles are knowledge. If you have this problem, you have to learn what it is. There's no other way around it. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is one and support is the other from people that understand addiction. You can't go to a professional that say, well, you could eat a little bit sweet on Saturday. Oh, God, mm -hmm. you know. You have to have an addiction trained specialist. And what about friends and family and colleagues? How do you deal with that when you've got an addiction? Do you are you upfront? Do you say, "I'm an yeah, uh, ask for help." And I said, you have no obligation to advertise to the world that you have an addiction. Tell mm -hmm. them that you want to try a different food plan lifestyle because of your health issues. That's yeah. not a lie. But, yeah. you know, as soon as people use the word addiction, so many people freak out. They're terrified of that word, which I think is a beautiful word <coughs> from Latin and means enslaved. We don't want to be enslaved. But if we don't understand the word addiction and embrace it, we can't heal. Mm -hmm. So I, I advise, you know, the people I work with to say, ask your family, tell your family that. I'm very serious. I want to really give this a shot for my health issues. And they always have lots of health issues. They could, you know, make a list of headache and blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, so would you please support me? Uh, I don't demand that you change what you eat. You can eat anything you want, but I would really appreciate if we don't have my drug food at home because seeing it, knowing it's there, trigger me. Could you eat that outside or lock it up somewhere where I don't know where it is? Could you please support me? So you don't put any uh, demand on them to change. But the interesting thing, and when you ask them nicely like that, could you help me? You know, so, well, I support you. I'll eat the way you eat. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how many people that have healed that way too. 
starting to, you know, feel much better, more energy, blah, 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 because uh, and usually uh, the husband say, you know, this is the best that ever happened to us to eat in this way. Mm. But he wasn't the addict. Mm. Or sometimes he was and she wasn't. So, you know, that that's uh, we teach them how to deal with that. That's fabulous. This is and then to go, you don't, I used to say, don't go to empty wells for nourishment. You know, mm. you yeah. go to the people that understand addiction. You don't speak to people that have no training and don't understand it. They are not your support system. Well, you know, what? what's really intrigued me about that is it's not something that I have ever learned anything about. And, you know, in all my years of training around health and nutrition and wellness, um, never really learned about how to help people with addictions differently from everybody else, which is an absolute disservice to yes, clients. yes, and yeah. you know, I I won't be the only one out there. You know, there'll be a whole world of nutritionists and health coaches out there who absolutely and doctors and nurses and everybody that yeah, yeah. have been uh, scared of the word addiction not understanding what it is mm -hmm. uh, and that training is absolutely fundamental to any health coach today to understand is this an addict then i have to do it in a different way i can't give them the same advice as the harmful users or the social users because you're going to make them sicker mm -hmm. Mm. Very important. Yep. So I've got another question or a last question. I always end up with more than one last question. <laughs> um, children. So oh. we look, we have all around the world, there is a problem with growing obesity and health issues amongst children. New Zealand is probably, you know, one of the countries at the forefront of this. It breaks my heart, the loss of potential from our children. And, you know, we talk I about totally agree. the agree. junk food and the processed food, but how many of these children are we triggering that genetic sensitivity to addiction? Well, you know, the amount of addicts increase all the time. And it starts there. So how many, I can't tell you, but lots and lots and lots, I can tell you that. It's the same in Sweden. And then we have all these teenagers that get the diagnosis, ADHD, ADD, depression, bipolar, uh, anxiety, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a lot of those diagnoses are aggravated or even caused by this toxic food. I'm convinced about that after all these years working this. So... <clears throat> The danger here, I mean, we have to be aware. First of all, we have to have awareness, knowledge. We have to start talking about it all the time. Um, you know, my colleague, Annika, she is excellent at working with kids and families. She choose to specialize in that. I have never worked with that. I'm not into kids and teenagers. You know, I, I work with adults because I figure if I work with the mom or dad or both, you know, they're going to put be a good role model for the children. So, of course, it, indirect, you know, I work with it, but I have not taken them as clients because I think you have to specialize in it if you're going to work with it. Mm. So she's a very good person to talk to about those things. And she's even written a book in Swedish about that, how to work with little sugar bombs. You know, we have this support group on Facebook called Sugar Bomb in Your Brain. Anyone is welcome. They want to learn more about this. So please join, but please answer the questions that pop up when you apply. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, this is the worst problem we're standing in because we're going to get so much sick people in the future if we don't start addressing this. So it's very good you bring it up. And I think there should be special support groups for parents and kids and because uh, the parents I know that try to change for their kid, they get resistance in the school among healthcare workers that don't want to accept it because they don't want to lose their drug. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. don't want to understand that you can't have a daycare, you can't have ice cream five days a week. Mm -hmm. You have to give more proper food 
And, you know, then we have the vegan mafia, as I call them in Stockholm. They are most in Stockholm. They're 2% of everybody. But boy, they can shout, don't eat meat, which yeah. is so dangerous. If you don't eat meat, you know, you ruin the best fuel for your mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So that's very, because you're going to get malnourished. So if you're a vegan, either you're going to have to pop a tremendous amount of uh, supplements or you're going to get malnourished in the long run. And one person that I love talking about, you know, how to do sustainable, healthy meat is Peter Ballerstedt in US. Oh, uh, yes. Peter, yeah, you know him. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, I love the guy and his knowledge. He's incredible. Wonderful lectures. And he's going to lecture in my uh, HMA training because I think his message is very important. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have, of course, Tim Noakes, Professor Tim Noakes, Nutrition Network. Yeah, um, I've done some training for them about addiction for the professionals. And also he's going to also talk in my, uh, actually, the 1st of September, he kicks off the fall semester. So, you know, and he is, you know, a legend uh, on the forefront working on this. And his book, The Lore of Nutrition, is absolutely amazing. So we, and I think in order to help the children, uh, all of us, you know, that work different parts of this field, we have to network and support each other because mm -hmm. there's so much resistance out there. And I know many years ago, the journalist, he interviewed me about sugar addiction. And of course, you know, all the professionals in Sweden, healthcare said, there's no such thing as sugar addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I thought, well, you're the flat earthers, as I call them. Uh, or you can't read English because the, the science is in English, you know. <laughs> that used to be very tough. And then this um, it was a doctor coming to one of my training and he said, how come you keep doing this when you get so beat down? And my answer is very simple, because I know I'm right. Well, we keep having this message that our brain needs sugar, you know, our brain. Woo, woo. You know, yeah. our brain Who do you sugar. think is behind that? Follow the money. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. And I mean, our brain does need sugar, but that doesn't mean we have to eat sugar. No, 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 no. We Get didn't have that when we were cavemen. No, yeah. we make our own sugar in our body. We, we make, make our own sugar from man. fat and protein. And yeah. another thing, oxytocin is the most important neurotransmitter hormone in our body for relaxation. Yeah. It is so uh, narrow-minded what people think it is. They think it has to do with childbirth and nursing. Uh -uh. It's a huge healing hormone for both men, women, and it is in animals. Your body cannot make oxytocin if it doesn't have fat and protein. Mm, mm. Mm. And you Good to know, right? Yeah, yeah. And that, gosh, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. And if you, if you, well, you could interview the professor and friend of mine, Shastin Ulmnes Mover, if you want. I connected oh. with her about oxytocin. Mm. That She's loving Mm. Yeah, she teaches in my training. You would really, that is blow your mind. You know, the knowledge we have about the research today. Also, I want to mention the textbook Process Food Addiction by Joan Ifland to anyone thinking there isn't enough science. There is 10,000 studies. 2,000 of them in, is in the textbook. And we use that in my training. Proper science. So, if you meet anyone saying there is no science, just tell them, oh, flat earther, goodbye. <laughs> That's what I do. Oh, I <laughs> so love tired it. Of it after all these years fighting this. Oh. oh, I do love it. Well, I was just, <laughs> you know, with the kiddies, I was thinking about you. You know, I was going back to when you were a child having those sugar cubes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stole them all the time. So, what? As soon as I could. What's the trigger? What's the alert for, for a family if they have a, a child that is like that? Well, they always want more of the sugary stuff. They don't want to eat real food. One mom said to me, I have three kids. One always wanted only to eat the white stuff, the beige stuff, you know, like pudding and yeah. sweet yogurt and cereals and, you know, just want that all the time. So they always want more. They hide, lie, and sneak to get more. So, you know, those are, they have loss of control. And one thing that's very important to notice with kids is mood swings. You wow. know, they get mood swings from that. And there are certain things, uh, you know, 
that you see. And also sometimes boys, uh, little boys can be very aggressive, fighting all the time. Little girls get whiny and have, oh, my stomach, oh, I have pain in my stomach. You know, uh, always some kind of health problem, stuffed nose, uh, you know, uh, no energy, uh, cranky, negative, and mood swings. Those are very alarming signs if your kid might have an, a very adverse reaction to it. And also remember, like with alcohol, you could drink pretty much pretty often and not be an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. You could drink very little, seldom, and be an alcoholic. It has to do with the drug's effect on your brain. It's the same with sugar. So people always ask me, how much did you eat then? Well, you know, it's not about amount or how often. It is about how my body, my brain react to it. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing to keep in mind. And also when we, when I train working with benzodiazepines, you know, the tranquilizers and the sleeping pills, there's something we call low dose addiction. It's the same with the painkillers, the opioids. Uh, it means that, you know, you get a prescription and you never exceed what the doctor told you, but your body, your brain has become uh, addicted to it. So you're constant in withdrawal. But you think that those symptoms that come are made from the, you know, main problem you had, not yeah. from withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So that's what is a low dose. And I have so many, uh, especially young people that are what I call restrictors because they want to be skinny, they are low dose sugar addicts. Mm -hmm. They don't eat copious, they, they are not volume eaters. No, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that comes later when they lose the battle, they start overeating and purging and exercising and do all kinds of strange things, yeah. uh, you know, but they are low dose addicts. And the, the red dog is really, really, yeah. Yeah, they think they yeah they think control is the key and they can do that for a while until their brain screws them up and they can't do it anymore and they start binging purging exercising and then finally they end up being volume addicts well, they eat all the time it would be wonderful um your lady that works with you with the children might be a wonderful introduction Annika Oh, yeah. 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 Annika is very lovely. She's a very, she has three kids. I don't have any kids. You know, I was the oldest of seven. So I choose to have dogs instead. I'm working. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was a conscious decision when I was 15. Uh, but anyway, so Annika has three children and she's a lovely mom. She has a milk cow farm like my sister does. And she's into dogs. She has three dogs right now. As <laughs> you can talk dogs. Uh, but she's a very lovely person. I work a lot with her. We we work, uh, you know, cooperate a lot, lot. Yeah, well, that could be a really good um, episode. Yeah, I think do she could well. give some, yeah, she could give some uh, guidelines how to start and, working and, with kids. And it's not easy. Parents, yeah, but I just think, you know, if, if we can get awareness out there for parents that this could be something that their child could develop. Yeah. Long-term implications. Um, yes. Lifelong. You know, it's great Lifelong. to start bringing that awareness. Hey, this has been absolutely, absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, would you thank you for having me on? Oh, it's just wonderful. Would you just go again? Tell everyone where they can find you. Um, okay, I'll make sure. Well, and and you are you are you books in English or are they in Swedish? No, not yet. I'm working on it. I've done that for years, but I never have time to really do it. But right now, I'm going to have people help me, so I'm not going to do it myself. So I'm working on it. But anyway, um, you find me on my website, bittensaddiction.com, and you uh, fo can follow my page, Bittens Addiction, on. Uh, uh, Instagram or uh, LinkedIn or um, Facebook, you know, and then uh, you have all the information you need, uh, you know, on there. And then uh, if you think you have a problem or if you are a professional wanting to learn more, join our big uh, closed group on Facebook called Sugar Bomb in Your Brain, which is the name of my first book. Uh, so we have over 10,400 members there. So oh. we try to post things and, you know, answer questions and all that kind of stuff. 
So uh, you can join that group. And we also have a group, Sugar Free Cookbook, because I wrote a cookbook. You know, me hating cooking. <laughs> I wrote a cookbook. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was my co-author. She loves recipes. I don't. I never follow recipe. I shoot from my hip when I cook. Uh, but anyway, so the sugar-free cookbook is also a support group because in the big group, we don't discuss food. We don't obsess about food. We don't post pictures of the drug food because it triggers people. Mm -hmm. We talk more about how to stay in recovery. And then you can go into the uh, sugar-free cookbook group and ask about food. And that's just, I told you, I never, I always have one more question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, that's okay. I, I forgot, I meant to ask you about artificial sweeteners and how oh, they yeah, yeah. Into yeah. The Well, yeah. they play havoc with your brain and biochemistry exactly like sugar does. It doesn't raise insulin, but it does destroy your microbiome, your intestinal flora. Uh, the sweet taste triggers insulin release. So, you know, if you're an addict, you can't have keto desserts or keto bread. It's going to trigger you no matter what. And it's going to ruin your biochemistry. We know that for sure today. Right. Cool. That was, that was great. To Sorry. Get that Sorry. One. But, you know, you know what the fun thing is with that? If you quit all the junk food, your taste buds will heal in a way that things going to uh, taste like you've never tasted it before. Mm. Mm -hmm. normal things like a tomato can be sweet or onions or you know anything you eat have a totally different flavor mm -hmm. because it's not hampered by the chemicals in the processed food mm -hmm. well Britain thank you so much once again and um, thank you so much yeah and we'll we'll talk again yes page. thank you